During these Sundays of Advent, our sermons are coming from uh, that passage we just read and heard, John chapter 1, which is a passage about the coming of Jesus. Uh, John doesn't say anything about Mary or Joseph uh, or away in a manger, but he is telling us about the coming of Christ. Any Bible reader who hears in the beginning will think of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John begins his gospel with these exact words because he wants us to see the story of that creator now acting in a new way. This new way is by entering his creation in the person of Jesus Christ, the Word, who he calls the Word of God. It is the story that began in Genesis that is now reaching a climax in the person of Jesus. In the Old Testament, God acts by his Word. Psalm 33, by the Word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And John calls Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, the Word. And he is the Word of God who has spoken to us. Jesus is the voice of God, uh, who comes from God, who was with God, who was God himself. You see Jesus, you see God. John is saying, you hear Jesus, you hear God. He's called the Word because he's God speaking to us, God expressing his mind and his heart and what he is about to us, his deep love for us. The Word is Jesus Christ, God's unique and one and only Son. And perhaps the most important verse in this passage, John 1, 1 through 18, is verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Some Bibles read and, and lived among us for a while. One translation reads, the word became flesh and took up residence. Another says, made his home with us. It means all those things. And the title for this sermon series, God Moved Into the Neighborhood, comes from how verse 14 reads in the message, uh, the Bible in contemporary language. If you've read the message or you have the message, uh, it's not a study Bible, it's a reading Bible. It tries to make the Bible as readable as possible, bringing out the spirit and the ideas behind the language in new and fresh ways so that anyone can read it. And John chapter 1 verse 14 reads in the message like this, that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. God moved into the neighborhood. That's a poignant picture of how God came in Jesus Christ. When you move into a neighborhood, you become a part of that place. You become a part of the area. God moved into the neighborhood and he became a part of this place called Earth, human existence. God moved into a human body. He moved into the human condition and into this world to rub shoulders with us in every way, to get close to us. I don't know if we have the closeness with our neighbors that many areas of the world do today. With our gated communities and our large yards and lots and our fences and larger homes, neighborhoods are often impersonal. impersonal. Uh, we prefer distance and privacy now. People pay big money to have distance and privacy. There may still be places where neighborhoods are still kind of communities and maybe you live in a place like that. When Nancy and I were first married, we lived in the inner city of Philadelphia for several years, and you live in very close conditions in Philadelphia. Uh, the area we, the neighborhood we lived in was settled by Irish and Italian and German, and German immigrants, but um, it was becoming more Polish. Uh, the Soviet Union, this was in the early 90s, Soviet Union had fallen and, and people were coming from Poland. Uh, many East Coast cities, if you've ever been there, are built house to house. Uh, wall to wall, backyard to backyard, and there's no distance. Uh, you, you, you saw your neighbors, you heard your neighbors, you got a sense for your neighbors for good or for bad. 
Teresa lived right next door to us in her three-story row house with her little dog. She, she ran a Hallmark card shop that was on the first floor. She lived on the second and third floors. The Koya family lived on the other side of us. Mom and dad, family of four kids. We could hear the conversations through our walls as the family shouted to one another from level to level. For that matter, the walls between the houses were so thin we could hear the phones ring, we could hear the television. Might have been able to eavesdrop if we really wanted to. Uh, Nancy and I lived on the second and third floor of a building, an apartment building, and the first floor was rented out, and it was a sports memorabilia shop run by two brothers. Uh, we got a sense of them, and they were nice. We got a sense from them from the uh, smell of marijuana that would waft up through the vents into our apartment. <laughs> We lived on a, it was a major avenue, so people were coming and going all day and all night long. Uh, we came upon our neighbors, we talked with them, we knew things about them by just observing and just by listening. People would sit out on their front step or on the sidewalk in the hot summer evenings. There was a park down on the corner, there was a bar across the street, there was a bakery and a pizza place and a delicatessen down the road, a doctor's office, a real estate office over here. And when we moved into that place, we became a part of the neighborhood. And we became part of the events that happened there, and we became known. At Christmas, we celebrate that God became a human being and, and moved into the human neighborhood. When John writes that Jesus dwelled or lived among us, the word actually means tabernacled or tented. Uh, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us is what John really wrote. And this has deep biblical overtones. You see, when Israel wandered in the wilderness, led by Moses for 40 years, the Lord instructed Moses to erect, to put together a tabernacle, also called the tent of meeting. Uh, wherever they went, they were to put this tabernacle up. Obviously, it was portable. As Israel traveled, when they would stop, they would put up the tabernacle. When they left, they would take it down and move on. And this tabernacle was where Moses would go to meet with the Lord. It was where the very presence of God would come into contact with those people. Um, it was where Moses prayed. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was, which held the Ten Commandments. And at the end of the book of Exodus, after this long description of the building of this portable tent tabernacle, we read, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The presence of the Lord dwelled in the tabernacle. This large tent, if you would, was where the Lord touched down in the middle of his people. It was how and where he kept touch with them and wanted to be with them. So when John writes that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, he is drawing a direct line to that tabernacle in Israel. Just as the Lord's presence and glory was in the middle of wherever Israel camped, so that same presence and glory came in human form and set up his shop in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why John goes on to say about Jesus, we have seen his glory making a direct parallel to that tent of meeting. As the glory of God was in that tabernacle, Jesus came and we saw his glory. And he camped out on this earth. He set up his tent on this earth. God camped with us. Now, I know tents are being replaced by motorhomes and, and, and campers today, but still, when you set up at a campground, you're in close quarters. You immediately enter a community where all the space and all the air and all this and sometimes even resources are shared. Things are close. You can't hide. God came close in Jesus. And he came to be known. He didn't come in a spaceship from beyond time and space and just plop down here. He came the way all of us come, through the womb of a woman. 
He didn't live in a separate castle or some tower apart from everyone else in Palestine. He actually lived a very ordinary life as a carpenter with ordinary people, even in poverty. He didn't come as a religious figure. Wasn't a priest. Had no role at the temple. In fact, his most sharp words and criticisms were for religious people. He didn't just keep to certain types of people. He didn't just come to the well-educated or the wealthy or the influential, but he called fishermen and, and some political hotheads and, and people who were kind of on the fringes of society, and he called them to follow him and be his disciples. And he touched all kinds of people. Others would not. One time he had a conversation with a woman of another social class and race who was fetching water at a well, and he would go to weddings, and he would go to dinner parties, and he ate, and he fished, and he was out in boats, and he practiced his faith and he traveled around this was God among us but it isn't always smooth for people who move into the neighborhood sometimes they aren't welcomed Several years ago, the house across the street from where we live now was up for sale. Been up for sale for a long time. We didn't think it was because of us, but you never know. I don't think it was. But any day, one day, a family who happened to be of Vietnamese, a Vietnamese family came uh, to look at the house. Apparently, they were pretty serious about it. Uh, and they went next door to meet and talk to uh, the person who lived next door, who happened to be an older woman who had lived on the block for many, many years. And she answered the door, and they shared. They were interested in the house. And uh, we understand you've lived here for a long time. What can you tell us about the neighborhood? And apparently, so I was told, the woman made a racial remark and promptly slammed the door in their faces. Needless to say, that family didn't move into the neighborhood. We never saw them again. It says Jesus, the word, was in the world, and though this very world was made through him, and he was the creator, the world did not recognize him. And he came to his very own people, his own race, his own religion, and flesh and blood, but they did not receive him. Jesus came into this world, and he moved into the neighborhood, and he got the door slammed in his face. And it's part of the irony of the gospel story. In fact, it isn't long, we know this, before Jesus is born and King Herod tries to track him down to kill him. Of course, eventually they do catch up with him, ironically, when one of his very own disciples turns him in and he is crucified. God moved into the world and we didn't recognize him. God was in our face and we turned our backs. Not everyone sang, joy to the world, the Lord has come when he came. What does that say about human beings? That God came and he was rejected. Later in John 3 it says, and this is the judgment, that the light came into the world, but human beings loved the darkness instead of the light. But God doesn't stop coming. Through, though the world condemned him, he didn't come to condemn the world. It says he came to save the world. When God moved into the neighborhood, he came with love and grace, and the message was, I want to be with you. The message was, I, I know your need. I know your longing. I see the predicament of this earth, and I love you enough to show grace and compassion, even though you reject me and rebel. But I come with mercy. I come with forgiveness. I come to give my very own life. When God put on flesh and he lived here as a human being for 33 years in human history, it says, you know, God's okay with us. He's not ashamed to be like us. And he felt the burdens of this human life just like we do. He felt the pain of losing someone to death. He felt the joys of celebration and singing with people and food and having friends. And he knew what it was to live under an impressive empire with bad politics. And he knew struggle and he knew success. And he knew loneliness and he knew fulfillment. 
and he knew what it was to have family tensions, and, and he knew what it took, what, what, what it meant to, be, to, to struggle with temptation and be tested. And he knew betrayal when he was turned in by one of his own circle of friends. It's easy to think, we look around today, that based on what we sometimes see as stands for Christianity in America, that Christianity is all about worldly power, the power to control, to impose one's will on others, to destroy enemies. And one might mistakenly think that Christianity blesses the politically powerful. The coming of Jesus is directly opposite to that. Christmas is God coming into this broken world and making it his home. And he came not with privilege, not with comfort, not with public celebration or self-glorification. No, he came with humility, in obscurity, more concerned with others than himself, ready to sacrifice. One pastor put it this way. Christ was born in a manger to a family for whom there was no room. He was raised by unremarkable parents in an unremarkable part of the world. He conducted a ministry that was missed by most people, died as a criminal on a cross, and at his ascension, he was seen only by a small band of disciples who then led a movement that changed the world in three centuries. God put on flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood because he wanted and he still wants to be near us and with us. And you know he is with you and he wants to be with you. Let's welcome him into our world, into our church, into our lives. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to see all that you reveal in Jesus Christ. We don't want to miss a single instance of grace. We don't want to overlook one part of this truth. We want to see it all, your glory in Christ. Come, Lord, to us this Advent. Come this Christmas. We praise you for being with us. We praise you for walking with us and helping us. Give us a deep sense of your goodness and presence in this Advent. Amen.